This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Hello. We're going to be talking about professional skills in the AAA exam. There are now 20 professional skills marks within the exam. So 80 for the content of your answer and then 20 extra for professional skills. As you know, there are three questions, a 50 marker and two 25 markers. So we would expect the professional skills to be 10 in the 50 marker and five in the other questions. The categories of professional skill, communication, analysis and evaluation, professional scepticism and judgment, and commercial acumen. And I know you will look at this and say, well, what am I supposed to do? So we're under extreme stress in the exam. How do I know if I'm getting these marks? Well, the most important thing is you've got to practice questions. And if you don't practice questions, you won't pass. I mean, that is 100% guaranteed. So when you've practiced the questions, when you've written your answer, had a go at your answer, then you have to look back and say, have I demonstrated these skills? Again, you will be saying to me, well, how am I supposed to know if I've demonstrated these skills? Because the words sound waffly. They're not waffly. And the aim of this session is to just give you some practical points about what to look at in your answers. And just say to yourself, did I do this? Did I do that? On a very, very practical level. Then in the exam, because you've been through that exercise, you won't have to panic about it. It will come a bit more automatically. So let's have a look at each of these aspects then. The first one is communication. Communication marks will only be given in question one. And it doesn't mean you mustn't communicate in the rest. It just means that these marks are only available in question one. The thing that strikes me is that they are very easy to get those marks. If you're saying specifically how many, well, we're not being given absolute benchmarks. Benchmarks, you know, are particularly helpful, I think. But these are the things that I think you should do in question one. And I think that will guarantee you or help to guarantee you your communication marks. Question one, set in the format of briefing notes. As you know, if you've been looking at past questions, we get a very large scenario and then we're asked to, to produce briefing notes. So in particular, format first, very easy, using headings and subheadings. That's going to give us a mark, isn't it, undoubtedly. So if subheadings are there throughout the briefing notes. Secondly, a short introduction. One sentence is probably enough if you can summarise what you're going to do possibly two. If it's any longer than that, then you're probably wasting time. The marks are for the introduction, not for any conclusion. So headings first, introduction second. Thirdly, clarity. Clarity, well, you say, if you say English is not your first language, you will not be clear. That is not a problem, as long as you can get across the idea of what you're trying to say. So if someone is sitting down and you say, he sit on the bench instead of he sits on the bench, is anyone going to get upset? Of course not. It's very clear what you meant in the first place. What you do need to do, though, is have empathy about your audience. So... If you're writing something for the audit partner, you probably 
don't need to go into a detailed explanation of the audit risk model because I think he knows what it is. In fact, he probably wrote it. If you're talking to junior staff, again, you need to be explaining things at a more basic level. That is, by the way, only if you get asked to explain the audit risk model, which um, you probably won't. But think about the audience. And the other thing that matters, I think, about communication is obedience. One thing that sunk into me in terms of the profession is I often think that professionalism is linked with obedience. And if you do what you're told to do, you probably end up being professional. And so historically, they get very upset if they ask you a question about audit risk and you do a question exclusively about business risk. And I can't see how you'd be getting a mark there for adherence to requests if you keep doing other things as well. So do what it says. A favourite is they ask for audit risks, they don't ask for procedures. Some candidates say, here are the procedures. So have those candidates stuck to the requirements? Uh, no. So in terms of communication, headings, introduction, empathy to your audience if possible. So empathy means sympathy and stick to the requirements and the requirements alone. There's communication. The second batch of skills, which could be in any of the questions, is analysis and evaluation. Again, that's not, it doesn't sound very practical, does it? When you've looked at a particular question, how do you know if you've got those marks? I've just picked out four things that matter. Number one, did you look at the stage at which the audit was? The classic is, are you at the planning stage before the audit work or the completion stage after the year end? And often students will type, we must go to the stock take or the inventory count, whereas the inventory count was two months ago. That's very bad. It shows poor analysis of the situation. So that student would not be getting their analysis mark. So we are aware whether we're at the start or the end, just when we think about what audit procedures might be appropriate. Secondly, calculations. You were born to be accountant, so you probably love calculations. But if we've used appropriate ratios, again, in a planning question, they don't want a schedule of 59 different ratios, including four different ways to calculate return on capital employed. But if you're looking at something like um, revenue, perhaps the calculation of the increase in revenue, the change in margin, possibly even receivable days might be relevant. So a sensible use of ratios. By the way, there's no put in put point in putting workings for ratios because the ratio will be a simple one you should be using and you can't really argue with the formulae. So you either get it right or wrong. Also, materiality. So where we're asked to think about materiality in a planning question, then we do a sensible calculation. If the profit of the client is, say, 10, well, 5% of 10 is 0.5. 10% of 10 is 1. So I'd say my range is 0.5 to 1. And then I'd look at the specific scenario. If the controls are very weak at the client, I'll say we'll go at the lower end of the range, 0.5 in determining materiality. So sensible calculations will help to get us our analysis marks. Reaching conclusions that are appropriate. Sometimes that means reaching any conclusion at all, particularly in audit opinion questions. So when we're asked to reach an opinion, it's absolutely pointless to say, well, 
my opinion might be adverse and it might be something else completely different, like a disclaimer. You know, that's going to show no discretion whatsoever. So it's getting to conclusions which hopefully are appropriate in the scenario. And not being afraid to say number four, where more information is needed. Now, sometimes we miss things in the scenario. That's human life, isn't it? But if you think something's missing and there's not enough information, don't be frightened. There's credit going there. There's not only credit going in your response for saying we need more information, but also credit going with the professional marks for the fact that you highlighted the need for the information in the first place. There's analysis then. So think about the stage of the audit, calculations appropriately, conclusions, and don't be afraid to ask for what's missing. Third skill is professional skepticism and judgment. I've just got the, very, the, the feeling that this is very, very, very important in the syllabus as it stands now, as it is very, very important for the profession. So when you're auditing something like a, a firm that retails clothes, if their inventory days are 365 and they've got a year's worth of clothes in stock, we should be standing back a bit and saying, well, it doesn't make sense, does it? They might have a season's stock, maybe that's half a year or a quarter year, not sure, but looking for things that look obviously wrong. So using, not saying, but using professional skepticism right the way through our answer. Questioning mind. Is the information credible? If I said that I travel to work on a helicopter, you would just go, no, you don't. I expect you get the bus. And yet in the exam, we freeze. So don't be frightened to challenge information that does not sound credible. Being alert to conditions that suggest misstatement. Remember, if they've got profit-related pay, they may wish to overstate profit. If the bank is relying on the accounts, they may wish to understate gearing. That all part of professional scepticism. Looking at the evidence, particularly when you're reviewing the, order, the evidence of junior um, auditors, have they relied on oral evidence? So discussing things like discuss with management, or have they used good third party evidence, like looking at the correspondence from the lawyers? Another aspect of scepticism and judgment is particularly with, I think, prioritization. And audit risk is probably the most significant thing that you need to prioritize in question one, but also elsewhere. We all know that when you start reading a question, it says, Boxo is a new client. And it's very tempting to start typing that we will not have enough knowledge and experience and we'll be busy, and I must phone my girlfriend or boyfriend, say I'll be late home from the audit. That's not really a significant audit risk, is it? What we need to do is to focus on the key ones first. There's no set pecking order, but you just need to make sure that where stuff is clearly a more significant risk, it comes out early in your analysis. The main thing is to get a couple of the key ones typed out first, which needs a little bit of planning. Easy, because you're using the software, so it's easy to, 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 to insert things. So my list is not definitive, but revenue is often a risk, isn't it? Going concern, if there are a load of factors that suggest they're not a going concern or face uncertainties. Fraudulent reporting, if there's any suggestion of profit-related pay, bank reliance, and so on. So a bit of prioritization will go well in terms of finding ourselves some sort of um, skepticism, judgment marks. 
The final area is commercial acumen, which again could be part of any of the questions. It's very easy for me to say be practical. Exam is not a normal situation. We're terribly stressed, so we're not always practical. I understand that, but we need to try and do better. We need to empathise with the business and what the business actually has in terms of risks. So I say, think realistically about the business that you are dealing with. So just, they make yoghurt. So just stand back for a day and say, we would not expect inventory days to be 96, or the yoghurt would be a bit smelly. So think about the business. Is it small? Is it large? Think about the audit procedures. Often, students will tell a business to close down for a week while they go round and inspect the inventory count. And the business obviously can't do that. So being practical or trying to be practical about the fact that if the business has the right controls in place, for example, continuous inventory counting, they don't have to shut down for a week at the year end. Frequently, students will use experts. And it's fine to use experts, an actuary for the pension if the client doesn't have one. If the client does have one, obviously, sometimes I'm not sure why we're bringing another one for a property valuation, I understand. But look back at your answer. If you've appointed five different experts, that will be the end of your business relationship with that client. They just won't want to play because you're using experts where sometimes you could have done the work or the client's already got a perfectly good expert in place. There's also a risk, I think, with association risk. So looking at the client, do we wish to be associated with that client or a particular industry or something? At the same time, I have seen students sometimes saying that they wish to resign from the client in question one, question two, and question three, which means they have no clients left. So let's look back through it again. What did we say? Communication, easier. Question one only. Headings, subheadings, introduction. <clears throat> Try and be clear and obey the requirements. All the questions, analysis, sensible use of numbers, sensitivity, whether we're at the planning or completion stage, not being frightened to draw conclusions. Skepticism and judgment. Well, is the evidence, are the procedures credible, sensible in the situation? Is there anything that suggests misstatement due to fraud, like profit-related pay? Prioritise your audit risks or other um, risks. And as far as possible, be practical. So do I want to be associated with the client? That's a possibility we need to think about. Am I empathetic to their business? Just thinking a bit about the business that they have, what they tell you in the scenario. And are the procedures, again, practical, again, um, sensible, uh, commercially sensible, again, for the audit firm? Don't forget audit software, very important now, again, in terms of procedures, in, ter in terms of cutting back on the hours and maximising efficiency. The ACCA have um, specimen exams in the practice platform, which have been rewritten, again, for these professional marks. So you need to look at those. We will also be uploading selected debriefs of questions, um, some of the questions in those exams, to show you in practical terms what I mean. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Don't forget, question practice, review at the end of each question, have you done the sorts of things that we've indicated? Perhaps make yourself a little checklist. Good luck.